obedience to the will of his eternal father. And also that he suffered death as the head of the human race. See, Adam was the old head. Christ is the new head. This is St. Augustine. See how we were bought. Christ hangs upon the cross. See what a price he makes his purchase. He sheds his blood. He buys with his blood. He buys with the blood of the spotless lamb. He buys with the blood of God's only son. He who buys is Christ. The price is his blood. The possession bought is the world. So he, he has purchased the entire human race with his blood. And that's one of the reasons why he's Christ the king. The human race belongs to him. He has paid the price of our enslavement, and now we belong to him. That's in uh, the document on the Christ the King by Pius XI, which is called. This purchase, however, does not immediately have its full effect since Christ, after redeeming the world at the lavish cost of his own blood, still must come into complete possession of the souls of men. Wherefore, that the redemption and the salvation of each person and of future generations unto the end of time may be effectively accomplished and be acceptable to God, it is necessary that men should individually come into vital contact with the sacrifice of the cross so that the merits which flow from it should be imparted to them. So the, sac the, the merits of the sacrifice of the cross are like a great treasure, but they have to be applied. I often use the analogy of having a, a starving man Having a can of food, but no can opener. So it, you have all the food that you need, but you can't get it. See, there has to be an application of the effects of the redemption to the human race. And that is the church. That is the priesthood. See, that's why priests exist, to baptize and primarily to say the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which applies the effects, draws men to God by means of the actual graces. But that's why baptism is a participation in the death of Christ. That's why in the early church they did immersion. That is, you go down, and St. Paul mentions this, as if dying in the sepulcher, and then you rise up as if rising. That was the, the way they did it. See? So there is a clear indication of original sin and death to sin in the right, the traditional rite of baptism. In the new rite, everything is, is initiation. If you look on like so at some of these things on YouTube, you know, these baptismal ceremonies, it's all initiation. You're becoming a Catholic, you're part of the Catholic community now, Doris. <laughs> You know, it's all very personal. And then everybody claps. And Doris is happy. You know, they, it's all, it's, now you're one of the gang. See, it, but baptism is primarily released from original sin. You can't get into the church unless you're freed from original sin. The initiation is dependent upon the, the death to sin, the participation in the, the blood of Christ. The water is symbolic of the blood of Christ, and it has the effect of the blood of Christ. That's why it's poured on you, not only on your hair. Right? I think that I tell you, I saw a video in the Cathedral of Atlanta where they, on the uh, Easter Vigil of 2016, where I think it's the Archbishop doing adult baptisms, and there were about 10 or 12. I saw one that was valid. It was a young man that had very short hair. 
and it, it certainly got on his scalp. The proof of it was that everybody else who had big, you know, mostly mostly women, but a number of men, uh, what they handed him a towel or her a towel, and they would wipe their head with it. They did not wipe their forehead with it, which means it only hit their head, and it could never have. If you see it, uh, it's on YouTube. You put that. You could. It never gets down to the scalp. You can tell right away. Cathedral of Atlanta. So anyway, so in a certain sense, it can be said that on Calvary, Christ built a font of purification and salvation, which he filled with the blood he shed. But if men do not bathe in it and there wash away the sin stains of their iniquities, they can never be purified and saved. So that is baptism. That's why the water is made on the very uh, in the holy triduum where Christ has died and Christ has risen. So you know, it's the redemption. It, 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 is, it is, has the power of the blood of Christ, that, that sacred water, has the power of the blood of Christ to, to remit sin. And penance is there to repair the soul after baptism when it has fallen back into sin. But again, it's the application of the merits of Christ. The cooperation of the faithful is acquired so that sinners may be individually purified in the blood of the Lamb, baptism. for though speaking generally, Christ reconciled by his painful death the whole human race with the Father, he wished that all should approach and be drawn to his cross, especially by means of the sacraments and the Eucharistic sacrifice to obtain the salutary fruits produced by him upon it. So the application of the cross to them. Through this active and individual participation, the members of the mystical body not only become daily more like their divine head, but the life flowing from the head is imparted to the members so that we can each repeat the words of St. Paul with Christ, I am nailed to the cross. I live, now not I, but Christ liveth in me. Galatians. See, we'll see later that the, the whole church, that is the entire mystical body, must be crucified with Christ. And how do you do that? By offering your own sacrifices, that is your own crosses that you bear every day for whatever, homework, uh, the <laughs> Latin, Greek, uh, the, all sorts of things that human beings are burdened with, diseases, uh, being crippled, old age, whatever it is, uh, marriage problems, family problems, financial problems. All of those things are offered to God through the sacrifice of the cross. So your participation is in, in that internal oblation of, uh, with the sacrifice of the cross. And all of those sacrifices are made worthy and are made, are elevated because they are attached to the sacrifice of the cross. See, so that's why the priest puts the cross on your forehead when you are a baby, because you are signed with the cross. Confirmation, you're signed with the cross. Signo te, signo crucis. The mystical body must be crucified with the physical body of Christ, and that happens through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so that interior oblation, and we'll see this again later, everything later, but this is just an introduction. The interior oblation of the faithful is their most important participation in them. If they don't have that, then they're just spectators as if at a ball game, in a way. See, so, but that has been lost in the new mass. They think they're participating because they're saying, and, and with your spirit, or and also with you, or whatever else they're saying. That is pure ritual. If there is no interior oblation of sacrifices and no understanding of sacrifice, 
They're lost. They don't know what they're doing. And before the council, people had that sense. They, they, they found it in their prayer books and their catechism, etc. Now it's all just come in and say the responses and shake hands with the person next to you and if, if they don't have germs. And, and uh, that's it. That's why it, it's a complete destruction of everything that is being said here. Their, their mystical body must be sacrificed. It must offer itself in immolation. It has to go through its agony in the garden and offer obedience to God. That's why you say the morning offering. There has to be a constant sense of sacrifice to God. That's why you become priests, in order to sacrifice your lives to God in a special way. Everybody has to. But the best way in which to sacrifice yourselves to God is by becoming a priest. It's, it's all there. We'll see. All right. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, yes, we have already explained sufficiently and of set, uh, of set purpose on another occasion that Jesus Christ, when dying on the cross, bestowed upon his church as a completely gratuitous gift, the immense treasure of the redemption. But when it is a question of distributing this treasure, he not only commits the work of sanctification to his immaculate spouse, meaning the church, but also wishes that, to a certain extent, sanctity should derive from her activity. Right? That's from Mr. Chikorpuri. So that means the activity primarily of priests. The august sacrifice of the altar is, as it were, the supreme instrument whereby the merits won by the divine redeemer upon the cross are distributed to the faithful. Very important sentence. That's why you become priests. That the merits won by the divine redeemer upon the cross are distributed to the faithful. The supreme instrument. As often as this commemorative sacrifice is offered, there is wrought the work of our redemption. It's the Roman Missal on the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. This, however, is so far from lessening the dignity of the actual sacrifice on Calvary, as the Protestants would say rather proclaims and renders more manifest its greatness and its necessity as the Council of Trent declares. Its daily immolation reminds us that there is no salvation except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and that God himself wishes that there should be a continuation of this sacrifice from the rising of the sun till the going down thereof. That's from Malachias, his famous prediction of the mass of prophet Malachi so that there be there may be no cessation of the hymn of praise and thanksgiving which man owes to God seeing that he required his help continually and has need of the blood of the redeemer to remit sin which challenges God's justice so as man sins constantly there is a constant mass going on and God is more pleased by the sacrifice of his son, then he is displeased by the heap of sin from day one to the last day of human beings. In other words, the fragrance of the mass is more pleasing to God than the stink, all the stink, the whole pile of stinking garbage of the human race from the first day until the last day. Of his existence, in other words, until the, the end of the world. That is the power and the efficacy of the mass, and primarily of the cross. That says a lot when you think of the. the, 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 the have you ever seen a garbage heap? You know, you drive by and the, the, all of 
it, it's like a mountain. Garbage is one of the few mountains in Michigan, for example, is the garbage heaps. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, there's a Chicago too. Yeah, Chicago is, yeah. That's it. But I mean that's just human waste. But just think about that. If you can transfer that to sit. It's it's just the earth is just a stinking mess. It stinks. It's like a cat box that is filled with all sorts of urine and excrement that nobody's changed for a long time. It's true. It stinks. That's a good analogy. I'm known for my analogies, by the way. That's a good one. I have to remember that. <laughs> well, I know I have two cats, and sometimes their cat box doesn't smell too good. All right? It is quite true that Christ is a priest, but he is a priest not for himself, but for us. When in, in the name of the whole human race, he offers our prayers and religious homage to the eternal father. He is also a victim for us since he substitutes himself for sinful man. Now the exhortation of the apostle, let, a, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus requires that all Christians should possess, as far as is humanly possible, the same dispositions as those which the divine Redeemer had when he offered himself in sacrifice. That is to say, they should, in a humble attitude of mind, pay adoration, honor, praise, and thanksgiving to the supreme majesty of God. Moreover, it means that they must assume to some extent the character of a victim that they deny themselves as the gospel commands, deny yourself and come follow me, that freely and of their own, and the, the middle part of that is take up your cross daily and follow me, that freely and of their own accord they do penance and that each detests and satisfies for his sins. It means, in a word, that we must all undergo with Christ a mystical death on the cross so that we can apply to ourselves the words of St. Paul, with Christ I am nailed to the cross. He also said in another place that the old man of Adam has been crucified. What, what is Christ in dying on the cross, the, 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 the old man, that is the, the old man that gives us original sin, has been crucified. And that's, you have to understand that. Now, so our blessed Lord was crucified, but what the reason why he was crucified was to become the new Adam of grace and redemption and to set aside the old Adam of, of sin. That's, that you have to understand. St. Paul speaks. You have to, sometimes he's a little obscure, as St. Peter says. But that, that's the, the, and I'm paraphrasing him, he says it better. The fact, however, that the faithful participate in the Eucharistic sacrifice does not mean that they are endowed with the priestly power. Very important. It is very necessary that you make this quite clear to your flocks. Now, this is 1947, when people are coming, you know, there's the Buninis running around and all the liturgical movements saying, well, the, you know, the, the people help and, in, in, you know, in the, they offer the Mass with the priests and all of this stuff. With a sense that they are, uh, it's congregational worship, what we call congregational worship, just like the Protestants are offering their the Protestant congregation actually performs the worship service, and the the minister simply presides over them, helps them, and tells them what hymn to sing, whatnot. That is the the new the mentality of the new mass. And that's why you have to scream out the responses, which are usually butchered by the people. The, their Latin is abominable, usually. Mm. 
occasionally in Europe, they've been doing the dialogue mass since the 1930s, and they think it's traditional. It is the most distracting thing that you've ever done to say mass with somebody screaming behind you all the, the responses. It's absolutely awful. Are they still doing that in France? Yes, sir. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that has to be the next thing is to get rid of that thing. <laughs> uh, fortunately, it never took in this country. They tried to introduce it. Oh, like the late 50s, early 60s. One was interesting. So, and it has no history whatsoever. There's no history of the dialogue mass. It was an invention. And it, the first dialogue mass was actually under Benedict XV. In the late, late teens, 1919 or something like that. And then there was a, a dialogue mass done by Pius XI in St. Peter's Basilica. So they were, the liturgy became the vehicle of modernism. They abandoned the direct attack of, of dogma and scripture, see, uh, where they were very exposed. But the liturgy then became, because liturgy is vague. See, it's, it's not, and little by little, they introduce these ideas through the liturgy. And you think, well, there's really nothing wrong with people saying the responses. And that's true. There's nothing wrong with that. There's, it's nothing evil about that. But when you add all of their ideas to it, it becomes something wrong. If they get the idea that they are of congregational worship, like the Protestants, what they call congregational worship, and that the, the mass is not primarily a sacerdotal act, then it's evil. And it became a vehicle of So uh, this, what he just said, make sure you uh, make it clear that they are not priests in the proper sense of the word. This has already been stated in the clearest terms by some of our predecessors and some doctors of the church. Not only, says Innocent III of immortal memory, do the priests offer the sacrifice, but also all the faithful. For what the priest does personally by virtue of his ministry, the faithful do collectively by virtue of their intention. That, that is how properly to assist that mass. If you had no rosary, no missal, you could make that intention. And that is the essential thing that you're doing. That's why you have a missal. That's why you might say the rosary. That's why you might use a prayer book to have that intention. So even if you couldn't read or write or had no rosary, didn't know how to say it, you could still perfectly participate in the Mass that way. We are happy, happy to recall one of uh, St. Robert Bellarmine's many statements on this subject. The sacrifice, he says, is principally offered in the person of Christ. Thus the oblation that follows the consecration is a sort of attestation that the whole church consents in the oblation made by Christ and offers it along with him. See, so the, see the baptism makes you capable of offering with the priest the sacrifice of the mass in your own way. Because you are by consent and assent to what he is doing and to offer yourself as an oblation, just as Christ did, in your own way, limited way. That is the participation in the Mass. Moreover, the rites and prayers of the Eucharistic sacrifice signify and show no less clearly that the oblation of the victim is made by the priests in company with the people. You'll see that. For not only does the sacred minister, after the oblation of the bread and wine, when he turns to the people, say the significant prayer, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to, to the Father Almighty. But also the prayers by which the divine victim is offered to God are generally expressed in plural number. 
And in these, it is indicated more than once that the people also participate in the august sacrifice in as much as they offer the same. The following words, for example, are used, for whom we offer, or who offer up to thee, that's in the Tejitur. We, we therefore beseech thee, O Lord, to be appeased and to receive this offering of our bounded duty as also of thy whole household. We, thy servants, as also thy whole people, do offer unto thy most excellent majesty of thine own gifts bestowed upon us a pure victim, a holy victim, a spotless victim. That's why the in the offertory, you see, the, the host and the wine, before they are consecrated, are actually representative of the whole church. And that's why there is, uh, there is, in the offertory, and we'll see this later, that there is an offering of the bread and wine, but that's not only what you're offering. The, the offering of the bread and wine, if that's all you're offering to God, that's an insult. That has only value in as much as they become the body and blood of Christ, and therefore your oblation, which, which is represented by the wine and the host, becomes only of value when it is immolated with Christ at the consecration. Yes. Is the idea of sacrifice also contained in that? In as much as it's separate? Yes. Or? And you, you'll see that in the offertory prayers. In the offertory prayers, you, you're really getting two things. We'll see, thank you. We'll see this later. Uh, there's some prayers that clearly refer to just the bread and wine as, as a sacrifice. Those referring to the sacrifice of the people. You see? So there's, there's three things. There's the there's the bread and wine. There's the sacrifice of the people. Their crosses, etc., their oblation. And then there's the sacrifice of Christ. Those three things are, you can see, in the offertory of the Mass. So some prayers refer directly to the just the this bread and wine, like the Veni Creat, Veni Sancte Spiris, Veni de Coq Sacrificio to Sacra Nomine Preparato. See, that's obviously for the bread and wine, because the blessing is the idea, is the consecration. But others, the Sushi Pe Sancte Pater Omnipotens, that is loaded with all of the theology of the sacrifice of Christ. And the sushi based on the Trinitas at the end is this. Because bread and wine isn't going to do any of those things that it asks for. The salvation of the human race and the redemption, and et cetera, et cetera. So we'll see that. Then the, the again you get a reference to the to the bread and wine at the Hankijitur, that this become for us, et cetera, et cetera. And after the consecration. It refers only to this, the offering of this, all of the, the, the angel taken up to heaven and referring to the sacrifice of Abraham and Melchizedek. And, and so we'll see the, those prayers later. But So there's, there's those three things going in the prayers of the Mass. You have to understand that, but they are all related. And that's why, yes. So where the Novus Ordo goes wrong, is that it? Diminishes and even eliminates numbers two and three. Is that yes? Is that In other words, we have this bread to offer. Mm -hmm. You see that, and, and I don't know what it's going to become you know, bread of life or something like that. And the spiritual drink, I think that was the worst right. thing. Yeah. Please, that comes from there's a reference to that in Moses in the Exodus, the spiritual drink. Yeah, it's a totally uh, Old Testament thing. And that comes from the Jewish uh, Seder service. I don't know if you know that, those prayers. The, this, the, their offertory is merely offering God bread and wine as our gifts to God. See? And then he gives us back himself at communion time. So he changes our gifts into himself, and then he gives those back to us. That's the theology of the new mass. It it yes the this 
the idea of the people crucifying themselves, the new religion. That's why they cross disappeared. Well, not, but they had crosses with the risen Christ, and and you know, the 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 emphasis on the cross. That was the cross is considered uh, um, negative theology. So it's cross, you know, it's bad. You don't want to look at it. It's done. You see, it's done. You don't have to look at it. It's the Protestant idea. And then, and then, of course, the sacrament. Get that? That's gone from the new mass. It's an exchange of gifts. That's in the uh, uh, study on the new mass uh, that it was done. It was ghost written by Bishop Gerard de Laurier back in uh, 1969 or something. The idea of the exchange of gifts. You can read that in that. It, that's available. What is it called? The uh, Ottaviani intervention. He analyzed that very well. I'm thinking also in the operatory prayers presentation of the gifts is what they call them. You know, it's sort of, yes. It says it will become the bread of life, it will become our spiritual drink. It's almost as if this offering, the purpose of it is that it will become something that we consume and the idea of sacrifice, that's not yeah. part of it. It's the, the drink, the drink and the eating is the main purpose. the purpose of the of the consecration is to make it God, or you know, some but they don't believe in transubstantiation anyway, but in some way to divinize it and give it back to us. So it's a whole meal thing. So let's put it in the oven and then it comes, you know, it's like bringing over. <laughs> I don't mean to, you know, it's it's something like that. That was where people come to your home and they bring something and you say, Oh, thank you very much. And then they cook it up and then they give it back to you. And they put it on the table at Thanksgiving. Here's here's a turkey, you know, and it's something like that, you see. And sacrifice is, is just gone from it. The participation of the sacrifice of the cross, my goodness. It's gone. See, that's where all the fasting is gone and all of the mortifications in the church are gone. All of that is part of the interior sacrifice of the people. That it has only value when it's attached to the sacrifice of the cross and the mass. It only has value that way. Otherwise, it's like Confederate money. It's, it's, it has no value. You could, you could sacrifice yourself. And you could shoot yourself. And it has no value in the order of salvation and redemption. It's something has to be attached to that. Now, in the early church, oh, okay. it's time. I was going to say, in the early church, they did bring up gifts. And they, they at that point, the offertory, that's why there's an offertory verse, because there was a big procession. Most of the gifts were for the priests, like carrots, uh, you know, uh, you know, loaves of bread or or other things that the priests might need, but some of it they did bake the bread for the altar, and that was brought over to at that point, and the deacon took it, uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's the reason why the missile is moved to the other side was because they they received those things, uh, and uh, so and then they would make the the Holy Eucharist from that offered bread, you see. So, but that eventually died out. But there was, there's a significant. If you understand this, that is significant. But if you just have the idea of people, you know, bringing something to God to have it changed into Holy Communion, it's terrible. See, but there is a participation of the people in the sacrifice, and that that showed their participation. Thank <laughs> you.